arguably the most recognized place in the West, is Monument Valley. This magnificent area was largely unknown outside the Navajo Nation until the 1930s, when Harry Goulding, the owner of the only hotel around, sent photos of the landscape near his hotel to Hollywood director John Ford. The images intrigued Ford. He ended up shooting several westerns here, and soon, to people around the world, this defined the American West. Later, parts of the Back to the Future movies were shot here. Later still, this is where Forrest Gump stopped running across the country. It's on semi-autonomous land under Navajo Nation jurisdiction. So Monument Valley is a Navajo Nation tribal park. It straddles the Arizona-Utah border. The park road turnoff is in Utah, but it quickly heads south back into Arizona. And like most parks, there is an entry fee. You'll spend many hours on the road just to get here. The nearest major airport is in Phoenix, over 300 miles away. Perhaps because it is so remote, few Americans come here. Almost all of the visitors are from Europe or the Far East. A surprising number get here on Harleys. It's pretty easy to take a photo worth hanging on your wall here. At the end of this video, I'll show you where some of the best photo opportunities are. While this view from the parking lot is really good, there's a better way to see this American icon. If your vehicle is up to it, you can drive through the valley for free. The 17-mile dirt road winds its way through the valley. Many of the overseas visitors get here on a tour bus that's too large for the road. So there is another option. For $40 to $75 each, you can take a guided tour in an open vehicle. Well, it's almost always hot and dusty on the approximately two-hour tour. So your own vehicle is likely to be the more comfortable choice. It's plenty wide and safe for most vehicles. Only large RVs and cars with very low ground clearance are not recommended. The view out the windscreen is always great, but the visitor's guide lists 11 viewpoints that are really special. The first is a view of the mittens from a slightly lower vantage point. They look a bit like hands, and hence the name, but they signify spiritual beings. The road continues to drop to the valley floor. The speed limit is 15 miles an hour, so there's plenty of time to see the sights. The next viewpoint is Elephant Butte. It's the large feature just ahead. They say with the right lighting, there's a resemblance to an elephant facing west. Like most of the landmarks in the valley, it does not have a Navajo name. Most were named by early settlers. It's quite easy to identify the next view. Those three spires in the distance are the three sisters. They represent a Catholic nun facing her two pupils. The road gets a bit sandy as it heads to one of the best known views in the valley. It was named after the man who made it famous, director John Ford. This view can be seen in many classic movies including the 1956 classic, The Searchers, with John Wayne. In one scene, you can see this spot before the road was built. There's a large parking area here, and locals are allowed to sell their handiwork in small shacks and on tables. For a couple of dollars, a man on a horse will even pose for you, so you can get that perfect shot. Viewpoint number five, Camel Butte, is the mesa on the right. After John Ford's point, the trail is a narrow one-way track that is pretty flat. View number six is Rain God Mesa. It's on the left. It marks the geological center of the park. It's named for the Rain God, who stored water for the people on the south side of the mesa. Seven is Sandy Springs Aquifers. I didn't see a spring, but there is plenty of sand in front of view number eight, the totem pole. Just to the left of the totem pole is one of the few features with a Navajo name. I can't pronounce it. It's something like Yi Bi Chi. The totem pole is one of the most photographed locations in the tribal park. To get up close, you'll have to hire a guide with a 4x4. From here, the road starts its return leg. It's a bit narrow and sandy. The winding path goes through some quite interesting scenery, including this balanced rock. After a slight incline, there's a large parking area for Artist Point, which is viewpoint number nine.
As the light changes throughout the day, the scene also changes here. And some hang out here all day. There are only two viewpoints left. The window can be seen from the road, but there's a better view of the mitten between the two buttes at the end of a short walking trail. The last viewpoint is called the thumb. Shortly after the thumb, the path joins the main two-way road back to the parking lot. Though you've been on this section before, you'll be amazed at how different it looks heading in the opposite direction. So take your time. On average, it takes one and a half to two and a half hours to complete the 17 mile loop. The average visitor stays only for a few hours, but to really see the place, you'll have to stay for at least a couple of days. Up until a few years ago, there was nothing on site but a small diner. Goulding's was the only hotel within 20 miles, and jobs for the locals were hard to come by. But in 2008, the Navajo opened the View Hotel. It has nice rooms for about $220 a night. There's also a new restaurant, gift shop, and small museum. If you've been here before, you may remember the $10 per night campground. Well, that's long gone. It's been replaced by cabins that cost at least $200 a night. Goulding's is four miles down the road. Rooms there are about $200 to $250 a night. There are many moderately priced hotels 20 plus miles to the south in the town of Cayenta, Arizona. If you stay there, believe it or not, you need to go to the Burger King to see a museum quality display describing the role of the Navajo wind talkers in World War II. If you're looking for an even cheaper motel, one can be found about 23 miles north of the valley in the Utah town of Mexican Hat. Here for $35, $38 if you're paying by credit card, you'll get a room at the Canyonlands Motel with no air conditioning, but it will have a bath and a plug to power your battery charges into. On my visit, it was full of partying Germans who were smoking and laughing into the wee hours. This caused me to wake up late and just miss the sun rising behind the mittens. But that didn't really matter because while shooting this time-lapse video, a man asked me to show him how to use his camera. Immediately after I did, he walked right into my shot, proving once again that no good deed goes unpunished. Now, here are a few hints on how to photograph this place. I've been here several times, dating back to 1996, and I've been lucky enough to take several good images over the years. But good light makes it much easier. And on one trip, I got nothing. It was in March. They say that's a good time to come, but for me, the sky was overcast for several days. I've had much better luck in May, June, and in the fall. Outside the park boundary, to the north, is where you'll find the classic shot of the road with Sentinel Mesa in the background. It can be taken on Highway 163 near mile marker 13. At one of the smaller turnouts on the northwest side of the road, there's even a small sign designating the spot where the fictional Forrest Gump quit his cross-country run. It's so popular that when the road was repaved, they even added a few parking turnouts to handle the crowds that come from all over the world. This group includes a minibus of Chinese, hipsters from the UK, and a minivan full of Aussies. And when I visit the next time, it wouldn't surprise me one bit if there's a ticket booth and a gift shop here too. The sun lights this side of the mesa in the morning. Here's what it looks like from the other side in the evening. This shot was taken on the main park road, just east of 163. These shots were taken next to the parking lot. By the way, several apps can tell you from which direction and when the sun will rise any day of the year. I use the iPhone app called Helios, but to get the shot, you'll have to get here plenty early, and you'll have to talk people out of walking into your shot, which is especially hard when they don't speak your language. The visitor center patio is a great place to watch the shadows move across the valley and up the buttes as the sun sinks below the horizon. To get some greenery in your shots of the mittens, drive down to the first pullout. The three sisters are backlit in the evening, as is the thumb. I tend to shoot John Ford's point in the afternoon and evening. And the man on the horse is much more likely to be there during the high summer season. He makes his living a few dollars at a time, posing, so bring a few dollars with you. I also tend to shoot Artist Point in the afternoon and evening, but you can get great stuff here all day. There are plenty of nice shots just about anywhere. All you have to do is look and find them.
there are advantages to hiring a guide for a private photo tour. In until recently, you could negotiate with a private guide. I once got a driver for a half a day for $75. Now you have to go through the official office to hire a guide. The fee is fixed by elders at about $300 each. If you have a family, this trip could be very expensive. The quote for a pre-sunrise drive for me and two others to a high nearby overlook on a mesa was $1,300. For this reason, photo group tour leaders have told me, told me that they will not be returning to Monument Valley until this policy changes. But if you want to get up close to the totem, well, you'll need a guide. These shots were taken in late afternoon. To get here, we had to drive through deep sand. The guide also took me to this little arch or window. One of my favorite spots in the valley is only accessible with the aid of a guide. It's called the teardrop. It takes about 45 minutes to get there. This shot was taken in early afternoon. Well, I hope this section will help you take your own photographic masterpieces in the wonderful Monument Valley. There's plenty more to see in the Four Corners area. Just 40 minutes up the road are a couple of amazing places. This formation gave a little town its name, Mexican Hat. Several dirt roads southeast of 163 are worth exploring. They lead to the backcountry. Back in the day, this formation was used as a navigation aid. Today, it's just one attraction of this unique area. Another road leads to a small canyon cut by the San Juan River beyond which lies an exposed fault. Geologists come here to decipher Earth's history. Photographers come here to capture the beauty of nearly 1,000 feet of stratified layers bending beneath the river. Even the rock here has an interesting story. If you're into geology, you know that the loose, unconsolidated rocks seen here are the remnants of the ancestral Rocky Mountains. That's right, before the current Rocky Mountains, there was another set, hundreds of millions of years ago. The first mountains in this area were as high as the Himalaya. Over time, they eroded away, so the rocks we see here are nothing more than debris. Eventually, the current Rockies will meet the same fate. A couple of hours spent here are spent well. An even better place to see what's left of the long-gone mountains is marked by a small sign reading Gooseneck State Park. This is one of the world's finest examples of an entrenched meander. It's rare for a river to make one horseshoe bend, but from this spot, three are visible. The San Juan River cuts through just over a thousand feet of rubble left by the original Rockies. The best way to see them is on a raft. An outfitter in the town of Mexican Hat will drop you off upstream and you'll travel through these canyons. There is little white water, depending on the season, and you can camp on the riverbank. The potential for great photography is obvious, but you need great light for great images. When I got here at mid-afternoon, it was cloudy and the light was bad. But I decided to wait it out. A few drops of rain started to fall, but the sun was still lighting the top of the canyons. I knew what that meant. Something good was about to happen. I just didn't know where it would be. One of the cameras caught a piece of it as the rainbow appeared. It only lasted for a few minutes, and I had to scramble to get some nice video and stills. This is one of those moments when all the hardships, disappointments, Bad weather, not to mention the expense of travel, make all the effort worthwhile. But it wasn't easy. I took a few shots with a still camera and then stitched them together into a panorama. This was taken on the second to the last day on an eight-day shoot. We drove over 3,300 miles, and this was only the second sellable image I came home with. You can stay here, there's a paved parking area and a flat dirt area where RVs and tenters can stay for no charge. There's no running water, but there are nice pit toilets. You're actually allowed to pitch a tent anywhere you like. If you're fit enough, you can even scramble your gear down a steep trail to camp on a small plateau 100 or so feet below the viewpoint. Many people talk about getting in touch with nature. The folks down there figured out a way to do it. 